Good evening. It's Tuesday, July 2nd. I'm Max Pringle. The Biden campaign has put out its June fundraising numbers. They show contributions up considerably over May, which the campaign hopes can help allay concerns that have arisen after his debate performance last week. This comes as the White House announces Biden will step up the number of unscripted public appearances in the coming weeks to try and put some of those doubts to rest. Hurricane Barrel churns its way through the Caribbean as a large Category 4 storm. The judge in former President Trump's New York hush money case has delayed his sentencing on dozens of counts of business fraud related to his paying off a porn star to keep quiet about an, an affair. And President Biden announces new federal excessive heat guidelines meant to protect U.S. workers. These stories and more are coming up on the KPFA Evening News. President Biden is facing renewed pressure to step down as his party's nominee for president. Texas Democratic Congressman Lloyd Doggett became the first member of Congress to call for Biden to drop out after his halting performance at last week's presidential debate with former President Trump. Sagar Magani has more. Lloyd Doggett is the first to publicly state what many have been privately whispering, saying the president should make the painful and difficult decision to withdraw after last week's debate performance. Doggett's explosive statement came minutes after former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told MSNBC it's legitimate to question whether the president's halting showing was just an episode or a condition. Sagar Magani, Washington. Meanwhile, the White House announced today that President Biden will step up the number of public events he participates in over the next few weeks. It's an effort to reassure the public that he's fit for another term in office after his shaky debate performance last week. More from Sagar Magani. Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett is the first Democrat publicly calling for the president to step Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett is the first Democrat publicly calling We'll have that story for you later in the newscast. The Biden re-election campaign and the Democratic National Committee have reported raising $264 million in this year's second quarter. It's an impressive haul that may help them calm fears within their own party about last week's shaky debate performance. The total announced today includes $127 million collected during June alone, when the campaign says it took in more than $33 million on the day of the debate in its aftermath. Biden also has $240 million in cash on hand. Hours later, the campaign of former President Trump announced an event, and even more, that is, robust $331 million for the second quarter. The Biden campaign has used its funds to help open 200-plus campaign offices in battleground states that work with state Democratic parties and have more than 1,000 staffers. Biden's team said that coming out of the debate last week, the, the campaign has staged 1,500 events across the battleground states. President Biden has proposed a new rule to address excessive heat in the workplace. The Democrat warns that tens of millions of people in the U.S. are under heat advisories now that high temperatures in the country are leading to weather-related deaths. Donna Warder reports. If finalized, the proposal would establish the first major federal safety standard of its kind and protect an estimated 36 million U.S. workers from injuries related to exposure to heat on the job. Last month here in D.C., temperature at 100 degrees. In Phoenix, Arizona, 112 degrees. In Las Vegas, 111 degrees. Above normal temperatures also are expected for much of the country in July, especially in central and eastern United States. Extreme heat 
this is, a, I think, going to surprise a lot of people, not you all. But extreme heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. More people die from extreme heat than floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes combined. Employers would be required to identify heat hazards, develop emergency response plans related to heat illness, and provide training to employers and supervisors on the signs and symptoms of illness related to heat exposure. Employers would also have to give employees rest breaks, shade and water, and give workers time to become acclimated to higher temperatures. Some 2,300 people in the U.S. died from heat-related illness in 2023. Donna Water, Washington. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani has been disbarred in New York over repeated false claims of election fraud in the 2020 presidential election on behalf of his then client, former President Trump. More from Julie Walker. Donald Trump's former legal advisor, Rudy Giuliani, was disbarred in New York after a court found he repeatedly made false statements about the former president's 2020 election loss. An appeals court ruling came Tuesday after Trump's main mouthpiece for false claims of election fraud had already been suspended. The court said in its decision Giuliani essentially conceded most of the facts supporting the alleged acts of misconduct. His attorney, Arthur Idala, says they put up a valiant effort to prevent disbarment but saw the writing on the wall. His spokesperson, Ted Goodman, calls it a politically and ideologically corrupted decision and says they will appeal. Giuliani rose from lawyer to federal prosecutor to someone once called America's mayor. Julie Walker, New York. The Food and Drug Administration has approved a new Alzheimer's drug that has been shown to slow the progression of the disease by several months. Ed Donahue has more. The Food and Drug Administration approved a second Alzheimer's drug. It's made by Eli Lilly and is called Kisunla and is for mild or early cases of dementia caused by Alzheimer's. Kisunla is only the second drug that's been convincingly shown to delay cognitive decline in patients. Last year, a similar drug from Japanese drug maker Azai was approved. Doctors who treat Alzheimer's say approval is an important step after decades of failed experimental treatments. Patients and their families will have to weigh the benefits against the downsides, including regular IV infusions and potentially dangerous side effects like brain swelling. Questions remain about which patients should get the drugs and how long they might benefit. Ed Donahue, Washington. The U.S. government is paying pharmaceutical company Moderna to develop a pandemic flu vaccine. Mike Hempen reports. Moderna is getting $176 million from the Department of Health and Human Services to accelerate development of a pandemic influenza vaccine that would be used to treat bird flu in people. Officials say the project can be quickly redirected to target another form of influenza if a different threat than the H5N1 form of bird flu emerges. That virus was detected earlier this year in dairy cows, and three people have been infected. But officials say the threat to the general population remains low. Mike Hempen, Washington. A New York judge today delayed former President Trump's sentencing in his hush money case until September to consider Supreme Court rulings on immunity. Manhattan prosecutors said today that they would be open to delaying Trump's sentencing for his hush money trial felony convictions. Julie Walker has more. Donald Trump's lawyers asked the judge in his hush money case to delay his July 11th sentencing, and the Manhattan DA now says they would be open to a delay of up to two weeks. This all comes in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling Monday granting broad immunity protections to presidents. Trump's attorneys want Judge Juan Marchand to throw out his conviction, but Pace University law professor Bennett Gershman says he doesn't think that will happen. Even if a president has absolute immunity, uh, a candidate for president and doesn't, and I think that was Judge Mershan's thinking from the beginning. I do agree some evidence came in when Trump became president, but again, that evidence was remote, irrelevant, and, and probably not even admissible. Julie Walker, New York. The recent controversial Supreme Court decision granting presidents broad immunity from prosecution for so-called official acts has heightened concern in this election year over who would be able to potentially shape the makeup of the Supreme Court for decades to come. 
More from Alex Gonzalez. Former President Donald Trump has taken credit for placing three conservative justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. And on Monday, the court awarded him a major win by giving him immunity from criminal prosecution for what are known as official acts taken while in office. New data show that a majority of voters in Arizona and around the country are paying attention and understand the impact the next president could have on the future of the U.S. Supreme Court. Sarah Harris with Stand Up America says whomever wins the election in November could select and appoint up to four new justices, reshaping the legal precedent in the U.S. for years to come. It's important to think about generations after us because many of the people who could potentially be put on the bench will be on there for 50 to 60 years, potentially, as justices continue to be appointed younger and younger. Harris adds that four of the current justices on the bench will be in their 70s in 2025 when the next president takes office. She says their recent poll found nearly 75 percent of voters say the selection and confirmation of future justices will be important when deciding who to support in the upcoming presidential and Senate races. Some argue the scandal-ridden Supreme Court makes the case for term limits, the 10-year Establishment and Retirement Modernization Act led by Democrat Congressman Hank Johnson, would create 18-year term limits for current and future justices, as well as provide two appointments to the court in each four-year presidential term. Harris says the justices should not be treated as if they're above the law. No one deserves power for life. What we've seen is that the court cannot regulate itself, and so having term limits would be really, really important. The Term Act was initially introduced in 2022, but died in committee. It was reintroduced last year, but there's been no action since. But that proposal and other Supreme Court reform initiatives have faced pushback from Republicans, who argue it would jeopardize the separation of powers between Congress and the court. For Public News Service, I'm Alex Gonzalez. Voters in France go to the polls again this week for a second round of voting following a major victory for the far right in the first round of voting on Sunday. And as Simon Marx reports, French President Emmanuel Macron is hoping to hold the line for the political center in that country. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marx. The French President Emmanuel Macron has less than a week to save France from the prospect of a government dominated by the far right. After gambling on a snap election, the French leader is so far on the losing end of the bet. The far-right Rassemblement National won more than a third of the vote in the first round of voting. Its leader Marine Le Pen boasted of wiping out the alliance led by President Macron, which placed third behind a left-wing coalition. Sophie Pedder is Paris bureau chief for The Economist. She says Macron is facing a political earthquake. His argument is, you know, the values that um, the far-right uh, embrace are not his values. He didn't use the term keep out the far-right, but he was implying that. I think that he has already taken a bit of a backseat during the first few last week of campaigning. I think he's beginning to understand that it's not helpful, even to his own candidates. It's uh, going to be a campaign that is very much led by the candidates in each constituency, some of them in very, very close contests from his own party. They did come top in about 60 or so constituencies. So, I mean, you know, this isn't a wipeout of the scale where he has no chance of getting seats. But it's um, it's going to be difficult, and they will definitely be fighting all the way to try and make sure that the far right doesn't get into power. But if the far right wins in the second round this coming weekend, its leaders will have their fingertips on power in France for the first time since the end of of World War II. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. A new Israeli evacuation order has sent Palestinians in Gaza streaming out of eastern Khan Yunus, the second largest city in the war-torn territory. The United Nations said today that the evacuation order affects roughly 250,000 people, although the exact number of people fleeing was not immediately known. The United Nations says more than 1.9 million people are now displaced inside Gaza. That's approximately four out of five people in the territory. Palestinians have been ordered to go to an Israeli-declared safe zone. However, an Israeli strike on a house inside the safe zone Tuesday killed at least 12 people, including nine members of the same family. Their surviving relatives said some of the dead had just fled Khan Yunus hours earlier. 
Evacuees have been told to seek refuge in sprawling tent camps in a coastal area that's already overcrowded and has few basic services. The war has largely cut off the flow of food, medicine, and foods to Gaza, and people there are now totally dependent on aid. A Palestinian health official says Israel released 55 Palestinian detainees from Gaza, including the director of the territory's main hospital. Mohammed Abu Selmia was detained in November when Israeli forces raided Al-Shifa Hospital. The officials accused Israeli authorities of torturing Palestinian detainees, some of whom died in custody. uh, Abu Selmia spoke through an interpreter on Al Jazeera. Many of the Palestinian detainees were killed under interrogation. They were denied food, water, and medicine. Many of the medical staff, including doctors and nurses, I left them behind as they are still in the Israeli prisons. From among the medical staff, Dr. Adnan Al-Burj and Dr. Iyad Rantisi were killed and may they rest in peace. The Israeli occupation forces left has no regard to any red lines. Israeli authorities have denied the allegations. Israel accuses militants of sheltering in hospitals and using them for military purposes. Human rights groups and Palestinian health officials say Israeli raids recklessly endanger civilians by forcing several hospitals to shut down or reduce services. And the White House announced today that President Biden will step up the number of public events he participates in over the next few weeks. It's an effort to reassure the public that he's fit for another term in office after his shaky debate performance. More from Sagar Magani. President Biden will launch a public events blitz as the White House pushes back against pressure on him to leave the race after last week's disastrous debate. Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett is the first Democrat publicly calling for the president to step aside as nominee. And former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi tells MSNBC asking about the president's halting performance is legitimate. To say, is this an episode or is this a a condition? At the White House. He had a cold and a bad night. Spokeswoman Corrine Jean-Pierre spent nearly an hour fielding questions about the president's performance and mental state. I'm not going to discount uh, what the American people see or feel. And says he'll make his case straight to them. He will meet this week with Democratic lawmakers and governors, do a network TV interview, visit two states, and hold a press conference. We want to turn the page on this. Sagar Magani, Washington. Some Arab American, Jewish, and civil rights groups are blasting proposed state legislation they say would chill campus free speech in California and lead to increased targeting of Palestinian students and faculty members. They're opposed to a measure aimed at protecting students in California colleges and universities from harassment and violence and another that would put Holocaust and genocide education in the hands of a group critics say ignores the Palestinian perspective. Christopher Martinez has more. The newly formed California-Palestine Solidarity Coalition is blasting what it calls misleading measures in the state legislature. The coalition of civil rights groups, students, unions, and other activists held a news conference outside the state capitol in Sacramento. Omar Altamimi is with the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE for short. Um, as we've seen protests erupt over the past seven months on college campuses, We've seen a almost militarized approach from colleges and campuses um, towards these students to silence them. One of the bills the activists are concerned about is Senate Bill 1287 by Democratic Senator Stephen Glazer of Contra Costa. It's aimed at protecting college and university students from harassment, violence, and discrimination. The Assembly Judiciary Committee's analysis of the measure says the bill is phrased in neutral language, but clearly responds to a specific development, namely campus protests against Israel's actions in Gaza. The actions of universities in this bill in particular encroach on constitutionally protected rights of our students, and it's a clear infringement on sacred First Amendment rights. 
Universities have always been the leading platform of dissent, free speech, and impactful protests. Ethnic studies, the ethnic studies curriculum was born out of encampments at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley. We have the civil rights and labor movements that were a cornerstone almost, um, or used universities as cornerstones to get out their message. Jonah Gottlieb also opposes SB 1287. He graduated from UC Berkeley last month. Where I, I found the most safety and community as a Jewish student at UC Berkeley was at our Free Palestine encampment on the Mario Savio steps at Sproul Plaza. Gottlieb says Glazer's bill would chill campus free speech and even incite more anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. He says the student encampment at Berkeley showed a better way. The community that we built in the encampment was one of solidarity, of learning, and open-mindedness, where we openly degreed, disagreed and talked about what a future liberated Palestine can and will look like. And we did that not by suppressing free speech and disagreement, but by welcoming it. We worked together, we collaborated, we built a beautiful community at UC Berkeley that is a microcosm of what I believe can and will be the future, both in the East Bay, where the Ark encampment was, but also in a free Palestine. Irish Rosenblum Sellers is a graduate student worker at UC Berkeley and a member of United Auto Workers Local 4811. She says the right to free speech on college campuses was won decades ago by students protesting the Vietnam War. That successful fight led to successful protest movements against South African apartheid and later protests against the Gulf War and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and now the genocidal war in Gaza. Though members of the legislature may support the current war, they cannot take the steps of passing SB 1287 and SB 1277, criminalizing campus protests and indoctrinating students into supporting the war. That second bill Rosenblum mentioned, SB 1277, is a measure by Democratic Senator Henry Stern of Los Angeles. The bill sets up a body called the California Teachers Collaborative for Holocaust and Genocide Education to be in charge of developing materials and teacher training on Holocaust and genocide in public schools. Critics say that collaborative has strong ties to pro-Israel groups, and they say the bill would freeze Palestinian perspectives out of the curriculum. Cassandra Kachakji is with the nonprofit Arab Resource and Organizing Center. These bills undo the good work of teachers who have been working alongside one another to educate and about relationships between anti-Semitism, anti-blackness, anti-racism, and Islamophobia. We stand united in rejecting these disingenuous attempts to gut our children's education and target Palestinian solidarity. SB 1277 is awaiting action in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Senator Glazer's 1287 is scheduled for a hearing in the Judiciary Committee on Tuesday, July 2nd. Meanwhile, Altamimi of CARE says the groups will continue to working to either block the two bills or at least to reduce the harm through amendments. We all hope to change the world for the better by ensuring that our students continue to have this right to speak freely. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. California State Attorney General Rob Bonta has released the State Justice Department's latest statewide annual crime report. This year's report found that while overall hate crimes in California have gone down, hate crimes targeting religious minorities has risen. Audie McAfee reports. Attorney General Rob Bonta's annual hate crime report breaks down statistics on hate crimes reported to law enforcement throughout California. The report is then used to help law enforcement officials better understand hate crimes and how to address them in the future. According to the hate crime report, events involving religious bias increased by 30% from 303 in 2022 to 394 in 2023. This includes attacks towards Jewish and Muslim people. Hate crimes are defined as a criminal act committed because of disability, gender, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, race, or ethnicity. In a video statement, Bonta said the uptick in hate crimes against religious minorities is disturbing. These are more than just statistics on a page. Each data point represents real people hurt by hate, real families, real communities affected by incredible pain and hardship. And we know these numbers only tell part of the story. Countless hate crimes are never reported. Countless Californians suffer in silence. 
The California chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE-CA, is a Muslim civil liberties and advocacy organization in California that collects hate crime reports so it can offer legal advice and education to the community. In 2023, the group received 607 hate crime reports concerning Muslim bias out of over 8,000 complaints. According to CARE-CA, that's an increase of 56% from 2022 a higher jump than when former President Donald Trump enforced the Muslim ban in 2017, which led to a 32% increase in reported hate crimes against Muslims. Omar Altamimi is the Senior Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for CARE-CA's Sacramento Valley Central California office. He said since the Hamas attack on October 7th, the four offices of CARE-CA have received the highest number of civil rights complaints in its 30-year history. A lot of it is, is what we're seeing on college campuses, students feeling unsafe, people feeling threatened for, for either being Arab or Palestinian, receiving hate comments or whatnot, people who are being targeted for, for their political views um, and opinions that they kind of express on social media or so on. Um, and, and, you know, people in not just the school or the workplace, but places of worship being vandalized and, and so on. The 2023 hate crime report says there are some limitations to obtaining accurate numbers such as community policing policies, diligent investigation by law enforcement agencies, and the likelihood for an individual with certain cultural practices to report a hate crime. Over 40 counties and county sheriff departments were unable to report a full year of data due to complications like unresolved reporting errors and staffing issues. This includes Solano and Santa Clara County. Omar Altamimi said he doesn't believe law enforcement is diligent when it comes to reporting hate crimes. He pointed to large discrepancies in the amount of reported Jewish hate crimes versus Muslim and Black ones in both CARE's civil rights report and Bonta's hate crime report. There's a strong distrust of law enforcement within the Muslim community. You see this in your Black and Latino communities as well. Communities that have been targeted by law enforcement do not trust law enforcement to report their crimes or you know their issues to. And as such, there is massive underreporting on, on the number of issues that these communities face. CARE-CA says it will continue its outreach and education on these types of civil matters. The group is hopeful that these reports will make a positive impact on members outside of marginalized communities to help reduce hate crime report numbers in the future. I'm Audie McAfee for KPFA. Victims of Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel sued Iran, Syria, and North Korea on Monday saying those governments supplied the militants with the money, weapons, and know-how needed to carry out the assault that precipitated the current war in Gaza. The lawsuit was filed in federal court in New York. It seeks at least $4 billion in damages for what the suit calls a coordination of extrajudicial killings, hostage takings, and related horrors for which the defendants provided material support and resources. Iran's mission to the United Nations declined to comment on the allegations, while Syria and North Korea did not respond. The United States has deemed Iran, Syria, and North Korea to be state sponsors of terrorism, and the U.S., along with the European Union, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, and other countries, have designated Hamas as what's known as a specially designated global terrorist organization. If the lawsuit's plaintiffs are successful, they could seek compensation from a fund created by Congress that allows American victims of terrorism to receive payouts, since such countries rarely abide by court rulings against them in the U.S. The money comes from seized assets, fines, or other penalties leveled against those that, for example, do business with a state sponsor of terrorism. The lawsuit draws on previous court findings reports from U.S. and other government agencies, and statements over some years by Hamas, Iranian, and Syrian officials about their ties. The complaint also points to indications that Hamas fighters used North Korean-made weapons in the October 7th attack, but the suit doesn't provide specific evidence that Tehran, Damas Damascus, or Pyongyang knew in advance about the assault. It accuses the three countries of providing weapons, technology, and financial support necessary, necessary for the attack to occur. Iran has denied knowing about the October 7th attack ahead of time, though officials up to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei have praised the assault. Iran has armed Hamas as a counter to Israel, which the Islamic Republic has long viewed as its regional enemy. 
In the years since the collapse of Tehran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers, Iran and Israel have been locked in a shadow war of attacks on land and at sea. Those attacks exploded into the open after an apparent Israeli attack targeting a military building located on Iran's embassy in Damascus, Syria, during the Israeli-Hamas war. It sparked Tehran's unprecedented drone and missile attack on Israel in April. Neighboring Syria has relied on Iranian support to keep embattled Syrian strongman Bashar Assad in power amid a grinding civil war that began with the 2011 Arab Spring protests. Like Iran, Syria also offered public support for Hamas after the October 7th attack. North Korea denies that it arms Hamas. However, a militant video and weapons seized by Israel show Hamas fighters likely fired North Korean-made weapons during the October 7th attack. The outgoing UN aid chief has warned that Sudan is facing what he called a horror beyond imagination, with 750,000 people under imminent threat of famine and with conditions in danger of worsening even further. British diplomat Martin Griffiths will retire from his job as the UN's Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs at a time when famine on a historic scale is looming in Sudan and in Gaza. Griffiths told the British publication The Guardian that while Gaza is the subject of intense media coverage and diplomatic effort, another potentially much larger man-made tragedy is unfolding in Sudan, largely out of the world's sight and with little sign of diplomatic progress. Statistics published last week by the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, or IPC, showed that 495,000 Palestinians in Gaza face an extreme lack of food, starvation, and exhaustion of coping capacities over the coming six months. Over the same period, however, the panel of experts estimated that more than 755,000 people in Sudan face the same Phase 5 catastrophic conditions, while a, f- with a, f- while a further 8.5 million Sudanese face a Phase 4 emergency, defined as a state where acute malnutrition, disease levels are excessively high, and the risk of hunger-related death is rapidly increasing. Griffiths told The Guardian that these are staggering numbers beyond imagination. Griffiths agreed with estimates by U.S. officials that without an influx of humanitarian relief and international donations, the outcome in Sudan could be even worse than the historic famine in Ethiopia, which, the U.N. estimates, killed one million people between 1983 and 1985. The 2024 Sudan Humanitarian Needs and Response Plan, launched at the end of last year, asked for $2.7 billion to address the crisis in Sudan, but as of this week, it had received received only 17% of that amount. A civil war between the Sudanese military and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, has been the major cause of the humanitarian disaster. Observers say both sides have shrugged off mediation efforts and are blocking access for food and other humanitarian aid. The United Nations and human rights groups say the RSF has targeted ethnic Masali and other non-Arab ethnic groups, killing thousands and driving out hundreds of thousands more in Sudan's West Darfur region. The UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide warned last month of the risk of genocide in the region. Meanwhile, the UN's humanitarian office has said that more than 55,000 people fled Sinjar, the capital of Sinar State in southeastern Sudan, as fighting rages between paramilitary forces and the regular army. The report came after the paramilitary rapid supply forces said on Saturday that they had taken Sinjar, where witnesses described intense fighting and civilians in panic to attempt to escape. The U.N. Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or OCHA, posted on social media that over 55,400 people have fled Sinjar town as conflict between the Sudanese armed forces and the RSF has spread to the town. The OCHA said aid groups in Gadaref, near Sudan's eastern border with Ethiopia, have started planning for the arrival of those fleeing the fighting. 
But the UN says Gaddafi is already hosting more than 600,000 people who fled the conflict. The OCHA reported that armed men, reportedly including members of the RSF, have ransacked and looted homes and shops and occupied government buildings in the city of Sinja. French prosecutors have requested that the country's highest court rule on the validity of the international arrest warrant for Syrian President Bashar Assad on war crimes charges during Syria's civil war. That's according to a statement released today. Judges at the Court of Appeal last week ruled that the arrest warrant issued by France for Assad in November is valid and remains in place, rejecting the prosecutor's argument that he has absolute immunity as a serving head of state. The lawyers for the victims said that, ru- that the ruling was the first time that a national court recognized that personal immunity of a serving head of state is not absolute. They hailed it as a historic judgment and a, quote, giant step forward in the fight against impunity. However, in a statement from the prosecutor's office, prosecutors said they filed an appeal in the court of cessation, describing it as a necessary form of a legal point of view, asking that the highest court examine the issue of personal immunity from a serving head of state as it relates to allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Lawyers representing the victims and non-governmental organizations who filed the complaint against the Syrian president in France are arguing that the prosecutor's appeal is unjustified. Lawyers for the victims say it is an opportunity to see Assad tried as an indep- in an independent court, along with an international arrest warrant for Assad. France's judiciary also issued last November warrants for his brother Maher Assad the commander of the 4th Armored Division, and two Syrian generals, Ghassan Abbas and Bassam al-Hassan, for alleged complicity in war crimes and crimes against humanity. The crimes include a 2013 chemical, chemical attack on then-opposition-held Damascus suburbs. Victims of the attack said France's decision to issue the warrants serves as a reminder of the horrors in Syria's civil war. The arrest warrants for Assad's brother and the two generals are not affected by the appeal. Lawyer said the four men, the two Assad brothers and the two generals, can be arrested and brought to France for questioning while the investigation into the 2013 attacks in eastern Ghouta and Douma continues. While Assad is unlikely to face trial in France, international warrants for a serving world leader are very rare and send a strong message about his leadership at a time when some, especially Arab countries, have welcomed him back into the diplomatic fold. More than 1,000 people were killed and thousands were injured in the August 2013 chemical attack on Douma and eastern Ghouta. The investigation into the attacks, conducted under universal jurisdiction in France by a special unit of the Paris Judicial Court, was opened in 2021 in response to a case filed by the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression on behalf of the survivors. More than a half million people have been killed in the decade-long Syrian civil war. Millions more have been displaced. The Conservation Fund, which works to protect land and nature across the U.S., has announced it has protected more than one million acres of working forest land nationwide, including in Oregon. More from Eric Tegatoff. The organization's milestone comes as forests are rapidly disappearing, as much as 13 million acres in the next few decades. The Conservation Fund's Brian Dangler says valuable work continues on the protected land, which adds to the nearby economy. The beauty of these projects is that the receipts from the timber, the sustainable management of forest, timber harvest, really helps local folks to keep the schools going, the fire department, the local services. The Conservation Fund has helped protect forest land in the Columbia River Gorge near Hood River and Deep River Woods near Astoria. Nationwide, it's secured forests in 21 states. The organization uses community and private partnerships to protect nature. Dangler says large, intact forests support jobs in rural communities through logging, trucking, building roads, and other activities. Of course, the wildlife habitat that goes along with it, good forest management usually improves wildlife habitat for lots of different species. 
Dangler says development is one of the biggest threats to forest and that it's important to keep forest lands as units rather than smaller parcels. Eventually, more and more development just nibbles away at these large intact forests. It's very important for them to be large in landscape. It's like Humpty Dumpty. You can't put it back together again when it gets fragmented so much. I'm Eric Tegedoff reporting. Philadelphia is deploying so-called street medicine units to help the city tackle the opioid crisis among that city's homeless population. The program comes from Medicaid dollars. More from Danielle Smith. This initiative was made possible by the recent Pennsylvania policy change allowing the city to build Medicaid for outreach site medicine. Mara St. Ledger from Project Home says the opioid epidemic has significantly increased homelessness in Philadelphia, and its mobile unit aims to offer both essential care and dignity to unhoused people. There are a number of organizations that are providing medical care to people who are unhoused, but we are the only team that we know of who is, we're providing primary care. So there are a lot of people that will go out with vans who will do point of care testing for HIV, for example. There's another van that just does wound care, but we do all of that. St. Ledger highlights the program's significant impact on participants, aiming to improve medical outcomes, build trust, and enhance access to health care and support services with holistic, trauma-informed, and harm reduction care. She notes that a few years ago, MPOC spread rapidly, but its collaboration with the local health department and community partners helped prevent further spread through vaccinations. St. Ledger says they rely heavily on their outreach team to build relationships with the participants, which helps the mobile unit assist people by providing them with resources. They try to engage with patients or with with people who are unhoused. You know, it might just be in the beginning bringing them some water, bringing them clean socks or a blanket, building those relationships, getting them referred to housing, to shelters, to detox, to rehab, whatever it might be. Dr. Judy Shertok is a physician and associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania who collaborates with Prevention Point Philadelphia on the overdose surgery response bus launched in the summer of 2020. Using city data to identify overdose hotspots, the team deploys its mobile unit to provide crucial resources to the hardest hit communities. And we collaboratively work to like do some canvassing, provide lots of harm reduction supplies, Narcan, and then for people that are interested, they can meet with the doctor and do same day starts of medication like buprenorphine for addiction. Shartok says a new survey on the mobile overdose response program examines several aspects, including the general demographics of around 200 patients. It also analyzes housing rates, substance use severity, and predictors of engagement and care after using the mobile unit. So the unit sees people for a few weeks and then links them to ongoing care. And so we try to look to see if there are any facilitators of what helps someone get from this mobile space into ongoing care and stay on medication. For Public News Service, I'm Danielle Smith. President Biden today unveiled new workplace heat rules aimed at protecting some 26 million workers from a heat stroke and other heat-related illnesses. He also took a swipe at Republican climate deniers, including former President Trump. Christopher Martinez has that story. Many scientists expect this summer to be the hottest on record, and President Joe Biden is announcing action on the issue aimed at protecting vulnerable workers. He spoke at the Emergency Operations Center in Washington, D.C., standing in front of a map showing heat across the United States. You know, summer has just started. Already, already, tens of millions of Americans are under heat warnings from record-shattering temperatures. Extreme heat is the deadliest form of extreme weather event, and Biden points out heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. More people die from extreme heat than floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes combined. Of course, floods and tornadoes and other effects of climate change are also cause for concern. Biden says his administration is now tracking Hurricane Barrel in the Caribbean, the earliest a Category 5 hurricane has ever been recorded. Ignoring climate change is deadly and dangerous and irresponsible. These climate-fueled extreme weather events don't just affect people's lives. They also cost money, they hurt the economy, and they have a significant negative psychological effect on people. 
He says last year, large weather-related disasters in the U.S. cost $90 billion in damages, driving almost two and a half million people from their homes, as well as threatening transportation, the power grid, farms, fisheries, and forests. And the impacts we're seeing are only going to get worse, get more frequent, more ferocious, hitting our most vulnerable people in the most hardest-hit communities in the world. Look, you know, we can change all that. So then our power. The big change that Biden has in mind is a landmark rule to protect workers from extreme heat. The Department of Labor is proposing a new rule that when finalized will establish the nation's first ever federal safety standard for excessive heat in the workplace. The proposed new rule would require employers to set up heat safety trainings, create emergency response plans, and provide water and shade for workers. Additional protections would kick in when the temperature rises above 80 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. New workers would be eased into hot jobs so their bodies can adjust. The rule is largely modeled on heat standards in California, Oregon, and Washington state, all of which were created after farmworker deaths from extreme heat, according to the United Farm Workers Union. UFW President Teresa Romero calls Biden's announcement a bittersweet moment for farmworkers, saying in a written statement, every significant heat safety regulation in America at the state and now federal level was written in the blood of farm workers. She says the new rule puts the federal government on the right side of history. Advocate Julie Fulcher with the group Public Citizen says the new rule, in her words, sounds comprehensive, like they are covering all their bases. But the new rule also has its critics, like Republican National Committee Chair Michael Watley, who says Biden is lighting money on fire to bolster his flailing campaign. But Biden took his own shots at climate deniers, including Republican lawmakers who voted en bloc against Biden's landmark climate legislation. Unfortunately, my predecessor and the MAGA Republicans in Congress are trying to undo all this progress. They still deny climate change even exists. They deny climate change even exists. They must be living in a hole somewhere. As of now, only five states have their own workplace heat safety rules. Two states, Texas and Florida, have passed legislation barring cities from requiring water and rest breaks for workplaces. And it's pretty likely that opponents will challenge Biden's proposed rule in court. That kind of opposition seems to baffle the president. I quite frankly think it's not only outrageous, it's really stupid. Everyone who willfully denies the impacts of climate change is condemning the American people to a dangerous future and either is really, really dumb or has some other motive of that. How can you deny there's climate change, for God's sake? Biden's announcement Tuesday included some other climate actions, including a billion dollars in grants for climate resilience projects and an upcoming first-ever White House summit on extreme heat. But the workplace heat standards are clearly the most dramatic step. At this point, there's no clear date for when the proposed rule could go into effect, but the rule will not be final before 2026. That would be midway into the next presidential term, and Republican candidate Donald Trump has already vowed to roll back Biden's various climate actions. So the fate of workplace heat protections for farm workers and others who work in the heat may well be in the hands of voters come November. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Top California Democrats announced this week that they will ask voters to approve a plan cracking down on retail theft. The plan, led by Governor Newsom, is an effort to compete with another business-backed crime-focused measure. Democratic lawmakers oppose that proposal, saying it would result in more people being put behind bars and a return to overcrowded prisons in the state. Scott Baba has more. Governor Gavin Newsom and Democratic lawmakers negotiated their own ballot plan over the weekend after failing to convince a tough-on-crime coalition to withdraw its efforts to reform Proposition 47 from the ballot. The progressive ballot measure approved by 60 percent of state voters in 2014, which reduced certain theft and drug possession offenses from felonies to misdemeanors to help address overcrowding in jails, and which expanded the state's investment in drug and mental health treatment. In recent years, Proposition 47 has become the focus of critics who say California is too lax on crime. Both proposals would make shoplifting a felony for repeat offenders and increase penalties for fentanyl dealers. 
Under the ballot measure proposed by a group of county district attorneys and backed by a coalition of business groups, any prior theft-related convictions, even if they happened years ago, would count towards a three-strike policy for increased sentences. It would also create a new class of offenses called treatment-mandated felony to charge those in possession of hard drugs like cocaine, meth, and fentanyl. Meanwhile, the ballot measure unveiled by Democratic lawmakers this week also proposes harsher punishment for repeat thieves, but the convictions would have to happen within three years of each other. At the same time, under the Democrats' plan, prosecutors could aggregate the amount of all stolen goods within three years to charge harsher offenses, and it would increase penalties for dealers who mix drugs with fentanyl without the purchaser's knowledge. Republican lawmakers blasted the Democrats' plan, calling it a, quote, sham to confuse voters. But Democratic lawmakers said the district attorney's proposal is too broad. They worry its changes would disproportionately incarcerate low-income people and those with substance use issues, rather than targeting ringleaders who hire large groups of people to steal goods for resale online. San Jose Mayor Matt Mahan joined San Francisco Mayor London Breed in supporting the district attorney ballot measure in February. He said that while the new ballot measure put forward by Democratic lawmakers is a step in the right direction, he still supports the older proposal because it mandates mental health and addiction treatment for those who commit certain felonies. We have people dying, literally dying on our streets for lack of supportive services, for lack of of treatment, sometimes for refusing to engage in treatment. And it is neither compassionate nor progressive to leave people to die on our streets. I think government's fundamental responsibility is keeping people safe. And this proposal, in my view, still falls short on that measure. The legislature will vote this week on whether the measure will appear on the ballot. If both propositions win over a majority of voters, the one with the highest number of yes votes will become law. I'm Scott Baba, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. California lawmakers passed new legislation today to create a standard for air monitoring at refineries across the state. Senate Bill 674, also known as the Refinery Pollution Reduction and Transparency Act, aims to protect the health of communities near refineries and to ensure that toxic pollutants are being measured properly. The bill is an expansion of a 2017 state law that mandates fence line air monitoring at petroleum refineries and in nearby communities. Democratic State Assembly member Rick Chavez Zabor of West Hollywood said that limitations in the program have become apparent in the years since the original law was passed, including a lack of real-time alerts, data not being available online, dangerous pollutants not being monitored, and some refineries being exempt from monitoring. He said this nil new bill would address that. For too long, communities across the state have been overburdened by refinery air pollution. SB 674 will ensure that there is greater transparency about the pollution entering our communities and require corrective action when dangerous levels of air pollution are detected. The bill was spearheaded by Democratic Majority Leader Lena Gonzalez of Long Beach. At a press release today, she said that the new legislation will guarantee transparency at refineries, which is vital, she says, to protecting public health. She said that the bill will mandate that refiners must provide timely notifications about emissions to the public. Refineries will also have to produce qu quarterly reports, real-time data gathered from monitoring, audits from a third party, and an analysis within 24 hours when there is an excess of emissions. The Refinery Pollution Reduction and Transparency Act will go to the Senate for a concurrence vote before going to Governor Newsom's desk. A California lawmakers have advanced a first-of-its-kind bill today that would regulate major artificial intelligence systems. The Safe and Secure Innovation for Frontier Artificial Intelligence Models Act would require AI companies to test their systems and safety measures, this would ensure that their technology could not be used for nefarious purposes like wiping out the state's electric grid or helping to build chemical weapons. Democratic State Senator Scott Weiner authored the bill. He says that it would prevent catastrophic harm. If you're going to be training and releasing these models that are so incredibly powerful, um, do an evaluation of large risks 
And if you identify a significant, huge risk of huge harm, take basic steps to try to reduce that risk. California lawmakers voted to move the bill through with only one no vote from Republican Assemblymember Diane Dixon. The bill is opposed by large tech companies like Meta and Google. Meta says that the proposed regulations are aimed too narrowly at developers and should instead focus on those who exploit AI in harmful ways. Senator Weiner addressed the bill's opponents today, saying the law wouldn't create new criminal charges for AI developers if their models were dangerously exploited, as long as they had taken steps to test their systems and to mitigate the possible risks. I heartily welcome constructive feedback, even from critics or opponents of bills. Um, I do think it's important um, that we be accurate when we talk about the bill. Unfortunately, there have been uh, some dialogue about this bill that has uh, spread some uh, unwarranted fear and concern uh, within uh, especially the startup uh, community. Scott Weiner said that this bill would apply to large labs spending over $100 million to train AI models. The legislation would only allow the state attorney general to pursue legal action. Meanwhile, state lawmakers considered two other measures today meant to protect Californians from AI. One would fight automated discrimination when companies use AI models to screen job resumes and rental apartment applications. The other would prohibit social media companies from collecting and selling data of minors without consent. Summer means outdoor events like concerts, festivals, and street fairs, and with these large gatherings come a wide variety of food and drink containers and other waste. The state of Indiana is taking an innovative approach to keep these items out of landfills. Terry D. has more. The Indianapolis Event Waste Guide is an environmentally focused publication with resources and contact information for nonprofits and vendors wanting to reduce waste. Ecosystems Events owner Julia Spangler says the publication is for events attended by a dozen or thousands of people. Bringing people together, especially if you're feeding them or decorating, just often generates waste. So this guide is all about First, how to reduce the amount of waste they generate in the first place, and then how to keep that waste out of the landfill. Spangler describes the publication as a one-stop shop starting point for recycling or composting food, waste, leftover lanyards, or banners. In 2021, Indiana collected more than 9 million tons of garbage, refuse, office waste, and other similar materials. The Indianapolis Event Waste Guide was released to coincide with the U.S. Olympic swimming trials held in Indianapolis last month as the state continues to draw large crowds in amateur and professional athletic competitions. Event planners are looking for ways to reduce their carbon footprint. Sustain Indy Community Manager Lindsay Tremere notes the guide is intended for local residents and out-of-town organizers. Just because you're planning an event in the town you live doesn't mean you're aware of all the different contacts and organizations that are local that can help you decrease your footprint. Tremere adds city leaders have a plan for Indianapolis to be net zero emissions by 2050. She says you can download the free guide on the Visit Indy website. I'm Terry D. reporting. Large swaths of California sweltered today as temperatures in some places topped 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And things are only expected to get worse during the 4th of July holiday week. That's according to the National Weather Service. The torrid conditions are being caused by a high ridge, by a, a ridge that is of high pressure just off the west coast, and a separate ridge that spawned heat warnings and advisories from Kansas and Missouri to the Gulf Coast states. Sacramento is under an excessive heat warning expected to last until Sunday night, with temperatures forecasted to reach between 105 and 115 degrees. And warm weather continues into the evening in the San Francisco Bay Area. Overnight lows in the 60s. An excessive heat warning again tomorrow. Highs in the 90s in the central San Joaquin Valley. Highs in the 80s overnight. Look for triple digits again tomorrow. That's it for the evening news. I'm Max Pringle. Rod Akeel is at the controls. Good evening.
Bill McGibbon. On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. Okay. He was old enough that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was long enough ago, frankly, that I'd more or less forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Okay. Um, it was really good for the young people who were there to see their elders acting the way that we need elders acting in a working society. Being willing to go out on the line for the future. Storytelling for Social Change on KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24 8BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.